Hi. Thank you very much, uh, Jens and Luis. And now with us is uh, Julia Kirali. Uh, Julia, you can already start um, sharing your screen while I introduce you, because now, um, while we have talked about the, the ECB uh, for quite a while and it being such an independent uh, organization, uh, such an independent central bank, uh, Julia is actually a professor of finance and monetary economics at the International Business School in Budapest in Hungary. And between 2007 and 2013, she served as the deputy governor responsible for for financial stability at the Central Bank of Hungary. And so now she can tell us a little bit about um, what that looks like. And we've uh, come up with this sort of provocative title of monetary populism in Hungary. Welcome, Julia, and uh, thanks for your presentation. Thank you, Michael, for the introduction and thanks for the invitation for this <clears throat> really very interesting and fantastic uh, conference. I think my very short presentation, a case study uh, will reflect what Louis just said 10 minutes ago. Uh, be careful, be very careful. So my dear left and right populist friends who on the one side would like to confine the uh, independence of central banks because the question of accountability. On the other hand, you would like to extend the mandate of the central banks to the far extreme and you feel that central banks should help to solve all the problems of the world, I think you should think over our special case study. It's about a small country in the middle of Europe. Uh, it doesn't move. Oh, yeah, okay. So Hungary was a crisis hit country during the great uh, global financial crisis, as uh, Daniela uh, outlines it in a fantastic paper, or Adam Tuse you can read, or even my book about the emerging European countries. Hungary faced the ethics denominated lending boom, which kind of carry trade investment, which resulted in a very deep liquidity crisis and economic crisis in 2008-2009, and gave emerge of the populist government the so-called Orban government. Uh, Viktor Orban is the prime minister of the government. It's a left nationalist. We cannot exclude that right nationalist and a bit of populist uh, political system. The best description you can find in a recently published book by Andras Kuroshini and his colleagues called the Orban regime, where you can learn how the checks and balances were destroyed, how this illiberal political system looks like, and how politics uh, dominates economics. As a matter of fact, do not look for economic philosophy of this regime, because policies, politics is dominant. And as a matter of fact, Economic policy is simple bricolage. So do not forget that within this system, we face an economic, especially economic part, which is the so-called Orban Empire, a white network of corporations and uh, holdings owned, privately owned by the family members and the political family members of the Prime Minister Orban. So, Economic policy is only a bricolage, but the target is always to support this empire. Let's see what about the central bank in such a political and economic system. So the Hungarian central bank, abbreviation MMB, during the first years of the Orban regime, when the management of the central banks were the earlier management, including myself, nominated by the former government, were heavily attacked. Our independence was attacked from day to day. Even the ECB and the European Union had to intervene. As soon as our term was over in 2013, attacks stopped and the central bank was simply incorporated in the political system. You can see there is an excellent paper about uh, Johnson and Barnes. And they, they describe it as the financial nationalism. Since then, the governor of the central bank is the former minister of finance and economy of Prime Minister Orban. 
So you can see that the central bank is absolutely independent. Nevertheless, it's one of the centers, political centers of the country. So since then, the MMB is omnipotent and super active. Enlarge the space of maneuver, postpone the Eurozone accession. Of course, we chose to opt out from the bank union. And several steps since 2013 you can uh, follow, not all of them ne uh, necessarily rational. I will not detail these steps, just to enumerate them. So, for example, the central bank increased the gold reserves in a small open economy which needs international reserves at the gold. It was told that the geopolitical reason, that's why they uh, have bought uh, gold, maybe expecting war, that knows why. It was the first European country who set up ramming this slope line with the Chinese central bank. Hmm, yeah, 0.5% of our trade is really with China, so we need the ramming this slope, necessarily one of the most important steps. Uh, the central bank created a fine and nice bank sovereign doom loop. It means they forced and in incentivized banks to buy uh, government papers. Actually, 30% of the bank's assets consist of treasury, long-term treasury bonds. Uh, and the central bank set up the foundation for higher education and art which is not a role of a central bank, okay? Not at all, but it's super active. Of course, reacted on the COVID, we cannot say a word, it was very useful. And it's omnipotent in the sense that it feels that he is really responsible for the world. Just take an example. Let's say the number of regular reports. Of course, central banks make researches but they make a few regular reports where, where they are really competent. For example, for the ECB, there are three main regular reports. The economic bulletin, the kind of monetary policy report or inflation report, the financial stability report, and the annual report. Okay, in the MMB, you find the same. And beside it, you find macro prudential report, housing market report, commercial real estate market report, productivity report, fintech and digitalization report, growth report, Tanzanian lending report, a report on balance of payments, payment system reports, insurance funds, capital market risk and uh, consumer protection report, public finance report, competitive net resource, blah, 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 blah. Can you imagine it? So many research centers, so many competence centers. So central bank in such a country behaves as an active, omnipotent economic policy center. That's what we are hoping for. Really, that's what you want to achieve. What's about its original target? Yeah, a little problem. Hungary actually uh, provides the highest inflation rate in Europe. Uh, in competition with Romania. The original tar inflation target of the Hungarian Central Bank was 3%. It has surpassed the 3% several times. Yeah, because in 2018, they declared that there will be a, not a single target, but a band between 2 and 4%. Sometimes we are above already 4% and now the inflation again increasing just as in, in Europe is increasing. So is it really our goal to extend the mandate of the central bank to make it responsible for all the benefit of the world and forget about its original mandate? And what's even worse, a central bank which loses transparency, I think it's not a real good political player in the, in the field. My last slide provide an insight in the Hungarian monetary policy. It will prove that the central bank of Hungary has lost its transparency. The main political monetary political tool 
the policy rate, that is the green line, line has lost its significance. In the Hungarian financial markets, nobody follows anymore the policy rate. It doesn't matter. The central bank is playing with other tools, which is modified from one month to the other to move the interbank market rate. The Bubor is the Budapest offer rate, the Budapest LIBOR, okay? And you see at the beginning of the last year, when the inflation went above 4%, the Hungarian Central Bank actually, true, in true way, increased its true policy rate by 60%, while no movement with the formal policy rate but it was a 60 basis point increase in interest rate. Then at the beginning of the COVID, they decreased it very quickly and probably fine. Then as we are um, uh, dirty uh, floaters and sometimes the foreign depreciates at a very, very high rate, it has a, a permanent uh, appreciation, but when it jumps, then the central bank immediately reacts. No change in the policy rate, but the true interest rate increased by 70 basis points. Okay, then slow decrease. By some moment of time, even the policy rate followed it. And at the end of September, when there was again a big depreciation of the foreign, the central bank did not move the policy rate because the philosophy of the governor of the central bank that we need cheap money and I will never increase the policy rate, he declared. So it was a secret increase in policy rate and the interbank rates again increased. So before, you put all the responsibilities for the central on the central banks to solve all the problems of the world. Before you take away their independence, do not forget that a populist government together with a populist central bank can do a lot of harm because we learned from Murphy. Anything that can go wrong, does go wrong. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Julia. That was a really powerful intervention. And um, you're just a great sort of inspirational speaker at a level as well, because I found myself laughing at least um, two or three times and definitely kind of showed how, um, yeah, we have to keep our eyes and our heads up um, when we talk about these central banking issues and that there needs to be um, clear rules, guidance, and, and democratic accountability as well if you're thinking about uh, reforming anything. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for, for joining us. And um, we're actually going to switch into a, a quick coffee break now, uh, 10 minutes. Um, you will find all the links in the chat now um, for our uh, upcoming workshop session. So now, um, just like some of you who might have been here yesterday, um, we will split up into three different rooms as you would at a conference in general. Just now we have to do it digitally. And uh, so you could choose which workshop you would like to join. And um, in the meantime, if you uh, want to spend your coffee break uh, mingling online, we um, have this little tool, it's called uh, Wonder Me and I'll put the uh, link in the chat as well. We used it yesterday, especially for the, for the longer break later and um, for the after the conference later, you can, you can join us there. So um, see you in the workshops and we will be back in this plenary session at um, 4.45 for the final keynote and debate. Thank you very much again, Julia and all the others that uh, presented, uh, Jens, Luis, Benjamin and Michal uh, for this great debate and uh, see you all later. <laughs>